Hello, all friends of motorized surfboards, e-foils, jet boards, and also what I might call alternative motorized watercraft. Whether you are a manufacturer or an owner or somewhere in between, this video is for us to talk about. This video is going to discuss the updated documents from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, the United States Coast Guard, pertaining to these watercraft, these vessels. Before we dive too deep into this serious and formal document, I'd like to offer my own opinion on whether these are vessels or watercraft or boats, as some people might label it. Based on the funny acronym for boat, bust out another thousand. If you are someone who e-foils and you really get into the sport and you want to buy an extra wing or two, you'll be busting out another thousand. So yes, I would say they are indeed boats. I will not be reading every bit of this document, but I will have this document as well as other documents linked or copied and pasted in the video description. So please check the video description to read in more detail at your own time. But I'd like to discuss a few highlights that stuck out to me in this document, particularly that they are indeed vessels, but they have been given their own subcategory and instead of being categorized as PWCs, personal watercraft, although your individual states may still categorize them as PWCs because a lot of documentation hasn't been updated to include these new acronyms. So this letter provides guidance on requirements for mechanically propelled personal hydrofoils, MPPH, for efoils. MPPH, which are also known as e-foils and electric hydrofoils, and mechanically propelled surfboards, MPS, which are also known as jet boards. Overall, the first page of this document declares these as vessels, but also acknowledges that they are different and makes some exceptions. This policy letter was developed to facilitate safe and enjoyable operation of these vessels. On to the second page at the top under definitions number three, all three subcategories of e-foils, motorized surfboards, and personal watercraft have a little bit further definition. I would like to point out A for MPPH e-foils. There is something that I found a bit alarming or strange. At the very end of the paragraph, it reads, non motorized hydrofoils also exist and while they are vessels they are not subject to the certificate of numbering requirements but may be registered by the state so according to this document even the non-motorized hydrofoil surfboards are considered vessels it looks like it may be up to the state on whether registration is required for those or not. So I find this probably the most strangest thing of this entire document. To me, that's kind of like requiring registration for a bicycle. Okay, so let's go ahead and continue on to number four. Number four is action. So again, considering registration, these are vessels and will require registration and everything required to get registration, such as a whole identification number, an HIN, which is the same or similar thing as a VIN or a VIN on a car. States may indicate these vessels as either personal watercraft or as other with the appropriate propulsion and engine drive type. Now, this was another thing that I was concerned about is with electric hydrofoils, we are able to change the propulsion type as simple as just detaching one mast and adding another mast. And some brands are now introducing something as simple as just twist on and twist off of changing from a propeller to a jet. If I had an e-foil that had the ability to easily swap between jet and propeller, I would probably put jet and bring in the jet attachment to have that 
on my certificate. And I can't wait to see the heads of the states spin when they learn about the new hybrid style boards that are beginning to come out, like the scuba jet, for example. It can be a jet board and it can be an e-foil. I think I can speak for just about everyone who is a fan of e-foils and say that I am very happy to see that there is no restriction on propulsion type, that there is no restrictions against open propellers, and that we are not required to have a prop guard, shroud, or duct, or even impeller or jet propulsion. We still have a choice of all types of propulsion for our e-foils. On the second page, under action number four, under Roman numeral three, number one, there is a one word exception that I'm happy to see regarding the placement of decals and registration on our e-foils and motorized surfboards. And it reads, certificate of numbering be painted on or permanently attached to the forward half of the vessel's deck. Keyword there, deck or freeboard. So it looks like they're now allowing us to put the numbers on the top of the board, which is really awesome because most e-foils and most jet boards don't really have much of a freeboard. And what is a freeboard? Well, in most simplest terms, a freeboard is basically the wall or the side of a watercraft. And when you have a rounded thin rail of a board, Putting three inch letters on that becomes difficult. It becomes difficult to read. And also those decals will also be subject to all of the water rushing across the board. And I've had some of my decals fall apart and get torn. And sometimes I've had to put uh, industrial tape like Gorilla, crystal clear Gorilla tape over the top to keep it from happening. So I'm a bit disappointed that they did not make any exceptions for smaller lettering. This is the only exception to the placement of decals that I see in this section of the documents. At the bottom of page two, moving into the top of page three, discusses incident reporting. So if you are in an accident or there's a casualty, one thing I'd like to point out is Roman numeral Two on page three, when reporting an incident to Coast Guard, states should make a comment in the incident narrative reported to the Coast Guard that the vessel is either a mechanically propelled personal hydrofoil or a motorized surfboard. They want to know what kind of craft is involved in these accidents, which tells me that they're going to be collecting, and they already have been collecting data on the safety of our e-foils and our jet boards. All eyes are on our awesome, cool, unusual alien watercraft, especially the e-foils as we're hovering above the water. So let's set good examples out there and do what we can to ride safe and respect others around us. Letter C, equipment requirement variance. This part of the document is the one thing that really stands out to me as the exception that has been made for general requirements to vessels, and that is that we are not required to have a fire extinguisher because carrying a fire extinguisher on board, there's just not enough room. It's going to be exposed to elements more often. It could be a tripping hazard, you know, a danger to the rider. And so they have made exception to not have a fire extinguisher. However, At the very bottom of this paragraph, I want to point out this one thing here. A fire extinguisher is not required on a gasoline-powered MPPH or MPS. I mean, there's not really any gasoline-powered foils. Uh, (laughs) I guess that would be a P P foil, petrol foil. Anyway. When the operator and any other person on board are wearing a U.S. Coast Guard approved personal flotation device, PFD, suitable for the activity. So if you are not wearing a uh, life jacket, you will have to carry a fire extinguisher. So if you don't want to carry a fire extinguisher, you must wear a life jacket. And it's interesting that they also mention any other person on board. 
Moving on to letter D, manufacturer compliance, and this discusses a topic that will be discussed later for users as well, so it's not just for manufacturers. Manufacturers are required to have a compliant engine cutoff switch or ECOS, an ECOS, or receive written exemption from commandment CGBSX. And when I read about this compliant engine cutoff switch, my first thought was the traditional, typical coiled lanyard that you see on personal watercraft and even a lot of boats that when you put it around your wrist and if the operator were to fly out of the vessel, the engine would cut off. And most e-foils use a Bluetooth connection type engine cutoff via the remote. But as I looked further into the documents of the ABYC A-33 compliant engine cutoff switch, it did mention an electronic fob. So the e-foil remote should count as a compliant engine cutoff switch, I imagine. But uh, this may be something I may need to learn more about. And uh, so I hope and I imagine most e-foils, because of the electronic fob, our handheld remote will comply with the emergency cutoff switch. The function of an engine cutoff switch should not only cut the engine in the absence of the operator, but should also require the operator to rearm the engine cutoff switch, such as in the case of the traditional lanyard, reattaching the lanyard before the watercraft can then again reaccelerate and be operated again. An electronic fob should work in a similar manner requiring input from the operator to rearm the watercraft for operation. Watercraft manufactured before the date of 2020 are exempt from having an ECOS. Moving on to letter E, owner operator compliance. And I'd like to point out uh, Roman numeral three. Carry the certificate of number when underway. Most e-foils have room in the battery compartment to be able to carry your registration. So you must have your registration on hand, but there's a few e-foils that don't. And so I'd like to suggest to manufacturers out there to make some kind of little compartment somewhere on the board for your registration is tiny. So if you make room for a cell phone and uh, keys and wallet, there'll definitely be room for, for that. Otherwise, you'll have to find some other way to carry your registration. Uh, you could possibly take a picture of it and uh, use that picture on your cell phone. Um, I always recommend carrying your cell phone with you for emergency in a drive bag at least. Roman numeral five, carry a fire extinguisher if required unless the all persons on board the vessel are wearing a U.S. Coast Guard approved personal flotation device. So here it doesn't you know, make a distinction of gas powered or not. And again, it mentions, if you are not wearing a life jacket, you will have to have a fire extinguisher. Six, carry a sound producing device, such as a whistle. I've been carrying a whistle almost since the first day I started e-foiling. A good brand of whistle that you can obtain is a Fox 40 FOX 40 whistle. Proper vessel lighting is required if operating at night. Roman numeral 8. Comply with ECOS requirements. The engine cutoff switch. So as I mentioned earlier, under the manufacturer's compliance section, the ECOS is something that will be required to be used. And the very last and very important thing I would like to point out is number 5. Disclaimer. The guidance in this policy letter is not a substitute for applicable federal or state legal requirements and is not a rule. The guidance in this policy letter is not intended to impose legally binding requirements on any party. This guidance represents the Coast Guard's current thinking on this topic and may assist states and general public and the Coast Guard in applying statutory and regulatory requirements. How all of this is observed and enforced will depend on state to state, location to location, waterway to waterway, person to person, and circumstance to circumstance. I don't know about you, 
but I know for a fact for me here at Lake Powell on the Glen Canyon National Recreation Area, the Park Service has indeed shared these documents amongst their employees and more than likely this will be enforced on Lake Powell and is likely to begin such enforcement and observance in other places in the United States as this is coming from the U.S. Coast Guard. Some people will see this document as something that is a bit of an obstacle. But again, for someone like me, this is opening doors because the National Park Service has been waiting for the Coast Guard to make a more official stance on motorized surfboards for the sake of commercial use of e-foils as an example of teaching e-foils as a business. And some of you may know, almost three and a half years ago, I submitted my first application for commercial use authorization of doing motorized surfboard lessons, e-foil lessons on Lake Powell. And the Park Service has been waiting this whole time for a more official response from the U.S. Coast Guard as this document shows. So now they are more open to the idea and a presentation of business opportunities using motorized surfboards on Lake Powell because of this document and this stance. The wording of this disclaimer also shows that this document, these guidelines are subject to change, of course. And being subject to change, if they change, we want them to change for our benefit, of course. And so once again, mentioning the incidents report section of this document, Please be respectful of the waterways that you are on and all of the boaters around you. Use some common sense, but continue to have fun. Live life to the foilist, and if you're not on a foil, you're on a jet board, then enjoy life to the fullest. And we can just continue to use our vessels in the best and most wonderful way we know how to do so. And our sport and everything can continue to evolve along with it in the best way possible. That's all I have to share. Please like and subscribe and this video will be included with other videos like it and a playlist at the top right that you can click on that includes other videos about registration and other guidelines. Please comment below about this video, my interpretations, your interpretations, especially if you found any other documents now and in the future pertaining to e-foiling and jet boarding and I will include them in the video description for everyone to find and a pinned comment at the top. See you in the next video. Goodbye.